it's uh, 7 p.m. Central European Summer Time. It's the time uh, for the webinar of uh, EOSOMI. Hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon to everyone. This is uh, Gennaro Dan from uh, Legnano near Milan, Italy, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here uh, another time uh, to moderate and co-moderate this uh, webinar. Today, in, uh, it's a joint webinar with the European Federation of Radiographers and Societies, a, a big part of our job, because uh, radiographers are uh, our great colleagues, and I'm very happy to be here to watch and listen uh, the colleague from the part of EFSR. And as usual, uh, I have my partner in crime uh, from uh, Holland, uh, Fanar Yilmaz. Thank you very much, Gennaro. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Robin de Costa. Uh, he's with us uh, from the Society, European Federation of Radiographer Society. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, his interests lie within the research in technology, innovation, and healthcare. And today he will be discussing uh, or enlightening uh, enlighten us uh, more about the framing of the fourth research paradigm and uh, he will give an educational perspective regarding this. Um, as usual, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and we will discuss these at the end of the panel discussion. So for now, Robin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. I will indeed try to enlighten us into the framing of the fourth research paradigm. It was quite a challenge to find a topic or a interesting element for this webinar. So I thought, why not combine two of the elements I see coming more and more up into research that I follow and monitor. So I think it's nothing new to us that the, the world is changing and we have quite some challenges ahead in food, in health, in sustainability. It's one big ecosystem that we have tried to manage and to rethink to make it uh, work for the future. That requests not only knowledge combination or a broader perspective, but also combining many, many professions like healthcare, data science, ethics, social science. Everyone has to come together in trying to save, um, save and solve these uh, questions. I added this big picture of the uh, machine from Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times that some of you might uh, know or have seen in the past. And it reminds me that there is indeed a new machine also popping up and that the entire combination of data and AI, which actually may us, allow us to solve these questions and support us in the, in the solution for these questions. And that's where my thoughts for this evening started and where I would like to go deeper into that with is that paradigm shift that is actually introduced by technologies and the transformative power it has in collaboration, in data drivenness, in decision making, but also to enhance how we look at patients and involve patients, patient centered care, and of course, also the ethical part. And that's where I would like to have a discussion and broaden it a bit more is indeed that paradigm shift that we are facing, how we are need to learn how to interpret data and communicate our findings, the context in which we have to play, and how it is actually involving into our decision making. So I will highlight a few elements, but I also cast some questions to the public um, as my aim for this webinar is more a mental exercise and try to see how we can actually uh, forecast in the, uh, the future. So if you also have any comments or other questions or response to my questions, please also put them in the Q&A box. But maybe just a bit more introduction about myself that you can actually understand how I look at this. Uh, questions. This is how my um, colleagues sometimes describe me or even my students as a professor who tries to describe uh, the future, but I'm still the right to be wrong about the future. So it's an exercise. And therefore I use a few lenses and a few concept, uh, concepts to actually do so, which I will briefly introduce it so that you can follow my reasoning along the presentation. I am a researcher, I'm very intrigued and busy with post phenomenology and that's actually a field in philosophy and I know that many might um, 
not like that field from their previous studies, but it's actually an intriguing field in which we try to see how society and political technology are influencing each other and actually how reality is mediated by the technology and translated to us as humans. That's actually the key element. I look at reality and I see it as being technology mediated. And it's something that we all know from other activities or from other technology, like, for example, these glasses. Glasses are an ideal element of translation because we will actually change the world and we will alternate reality to make sure that the one who is observing the reality will see it as it is. So this is for me an ideal element of technology mediation in which we see how technology is actually put between the human and the world. So this is a bit of my framework in which I try to look at these um, discussions and these elements of framing and third world paradigm. When it comes to imaging, because that's of course the topic of tonight, um, I look at a radiograph and it has the same properties it is actually a technology that reveals the hidden and it's actually projecting what is unseen through the world into one uh, image. In the same way, there's actually a microscope is also revealing reality um, to ourselves, but then for the microorganisms that's doing the same element is actually making sure that we can see those very little uh, microorganisms. But of course, Radiology is a bit more complex, certainly when we look at it from another angle, and is that the image is actually computed. We reconstruct our um, images, which is a very interesting approach or a very interesting thought for me, as these complex uh, calculations make a very dis interesting distinction between the acquisition of the data and the actually image that we look at. Because, and many of you will know these, and eh, the, uh, we have here, two raw data projections. The left one is actually a CT image. The right one is an MRI image. And it's actually, again, very interesting to uh, analyze this from this point, because now we are looking at that raw data. They might conceal more information than the actual image, which we are looking at. So the image becomes, in this very straight discussion, something that we could call is a visualization of that raw data. And for me, that's an important thought to keep in mind for the rest of this presentation when it comes to the fourth paradigm and the framing in the fourth paradigm. So the lens I'm using here is to look at an image as calculated presentation of a suspected reality. Of course, when we look at all the developments we are now seeing with the AI development and the data development, what I mainly see is that we are trying to evolve and influence the human limit. And I think this has been in publications and in literature. And some would speak, speak about the painful divorce between radiology and radiologists. Other ones would certainly speak about the change that it would do to the workplace. I think it's very clear that radiographers and radiologists have their place even in a world with AI, but that it will change the world, that is for sure. And when I look at some publications or I try to follow as many publications as I can, for example, here the statement about ESR is also indeed very interesting. We need to be sure about the clinical benefit. We need to implement AI in our workflows, but then it becomes very interesting. How do we actually do so? That discussion point. We also need to be sure that the, the AI we are introducing is actually appropriate, that there is a safe balance for the patient, that it has benefits, and we need to embrace it in that way. And that's a really big, really big challenge in which these themes uh, fit. And of course, how to deal with this for future generations. At the same time that I'm now stating that you are actually enhancing the human limit in the interpretation of the image, we also see that there is in some research um, an evolution where we notice um, that research groups are actually looking at raw data like the sinogram and like the case space I presented to actually do interpretation of images already. So they try to go beyond that image and look at raw data beyond the perception. It's quite interesting, but again, it's an interesting also for challenging that safe balance and keep that AI safe and our patients safe. When I bring those two ideas already together, when it comes to the uh, concept of an image being a data being acquired during the imaging technique, 
And I combine this with the idea that we can actually look with an AI to the raw data. It makes me sometimes think about Jarvis, for those who know him, and actually develop us a tool that actually allows us to look at the data from another's perspective. So it lacks a tool, the AI tool is not only there to support in looking at the images, but it becomes really a tool, it becomes a microscope to actually look at that world of the hidden data, of the hidden world, and try us to bring us further than the vision that we have as an observer now when it comes to the clear standard images that we know. So do we have actually a tool we can manipulate to explore the data at that point? Of course, when you look now at the current paradigm, we are looking at incremental innovations, eh? reduce errors, process information, process more and more images. We look at workflow improvements and advanced calculation. But for me, the next step would actually be that we try to develop algorithms that go beyond that part and not only enhance the human limits, but allow us to look at a totally new way at the same data. Of course, what has this now to do with the fourth paradigm? I think this is now the question that many of you have after these first 10 minutes introduction into that part of data. For me, then we need to keep the safe balance and it's an incremental innovation. Uh, we have to rethink our microscope. So the question I actually am putting on the table is, can we actually imagine a radiology department where the images are just a secondary prime, a secondary data and not the primary data? So can we reimagine how we can actually collect data from patients and look at it, it with new glasses, with new elements? This is an interesting shift when I combine this with research, because in research, we look at the reality and there are a few paradigms. There is a positivist, we look at very quantitative methods, interpretivist, we look at qualitative methods. We also have the critical theory, which now more and more standard, in which we explore mixed methods, uh, in which we try to um, grasp the objective value of data that combined with more the insights of qualitative, <laughs> of qualitative research. And of course, there's also constructivism which uh, looks more from the experience and construction of reality. All these paradigms have been classified as first paradigm, second paradigm, and even third paradigm. And the third paradigm, the mixed methods in which we try to enhance or enrich uh, quantitative data, um, is still under development. Some are already speaking about the fourth paradigm. And that is a combination of mixed methods quantitative, qualitative with data. It requires interdisciplinary approaches. And I'm not, not only speaking about professions, but I'm only also speaking about um, approaches to that same research paradigm. And the basic line there is that we actually look at the links into the data and let it emerge from it. So that we go a step further and that we actually allow the data to speak to us and to demonstrate which links are uh, present, not so much as the uh, normal way of, of the dominant paradigm of doing research that we know uh, at the moment is where we formulate the hypothesis, we do an experiment, we generate data, and then we'll test it and retest it, and we validate it. So all the links that we see are based on, based on hypotheses that we actually provided. No, we will design an algorithm that will actually allow us to search that pattern. And this was proposed by Van, uh, Van Helden a uh, few years already ago, but it's still an interesting idea that not just looking at what we actually would like to find, but just to gather all the data together and see in which way it might actually en enrich uh, our insight. This is also a very interesting idea or interesting thought that we need to discuss as a scientific community as this will be able us to um, go beyond with the ever larger data sets and fragment sources that we need to combine and also that in data uh, gathering. So for me, it's not about the actual pioneer shift and where we are going, it's more also about the discussion as new evolutions by the end of this uh, year. So they are very near with real world data being entering and the health data space uh, being uh, available or coming available. We need also to be able to answer these questions on methodological know-how and how to deal with this data and these combinations of data and allow us to explore this much further and go in depth of imaging and looking at, at a new way. And of course, there are some 
uh, frameworks from GDPR that we need to take into account. And we need to collect the data only that we need it. But there, of course, we need to also have that kind of discussion with uh, the legal and the data and governance. So for this first section, I was already thinking the medical image as a visual presentation, is this really the best way that we can look at an image or do we need to push it uh, further and further on? And of course, in a way that we can deal with real world data and all the data that's stored about our patients in, for example, the health data space. And in my title, there was a second part and that's a part of framing and the educational perspective on framing. So where does this come into part? Of course, there is an important element. There is a methodology that we need to know and that we need again to agree on, on how to deal with this very large data set and methodologically uh, evaluate them, do research on them, validate them and be transparent about our communications as we also do now in the third paradigm. But on the same side, you also need clinical know-how and that clinical know-how comes very close to decision-making studies and comes very close to the prospect theory. In the prospect theory, we actually look at how clinicians and how healthcare providers make certain decisions. Decisions about their patients and about treatments and operative therapy that they must give. And there we see quite some variability. Um, variability is based on the presentation of information, um, but also the perception of it and the cognitive processes how people reason and how people make decisions uh, to a certain end. And there, and that's why it comes very interesting again, we notice that in data-driven decision-making, so that type of decision-making that's coming very close to using real-world data, we actually see that the variability increases when data is presented by probabilities and intervals. Unluckily, those two elements are actually the way that we communicate data. And that's how we actually also provide um, data to the end users. So from the same point, when we start to training and educating uh, healthcare providers, there are already ideas that we need more insight, first of all, in that decision making and in that framing element, that we might also need to upskill and reskill very specifically for those data driven decisional processes to actually lower the variability and make better and higher decisions. There, of course, is also discussion when you look at the review of real world data, is it still an evidence based or evidence informed to retake the context of the patient um, into our reasoning, to our decision making? All these elements might enlarge, again, the framing and the variability, but that part should be countered by the use of real world data and by supporting our decision making with that data element. And when we look at the entire evolution and when we look at the problematic part of framing, it's not only the healthcare providers who are now challenged, it's also the patients because with Europe moving, moving towards the European health data space and empowering patients, adding trust, discussion on trust, patients that can add data very soon to their own uh, medical records, we will also expect patients to act and react on certain elements. And then my question here is, do we actually organize healthcare for patients? Is it really patient-centered care? Or do we look here as a patient as a partner? And do we also expect patients to actually combine and act and react on base the data that they see? Of course, here, again, just as with healthcare providers, there's also a need for, first of all, health literacy and digital literacy in patients, but it's also a new concept and it's also a new challenge for healthcare providers to actually explain and collaborate with patients who are not educated in the same way to actually correctly act and react based on these elements. Also for radiographers and radiologists, this will become a challenge as people and patients will enter our departments knowledgeable about their data and asking questions on how to act and react on these data. And this is of course a non-technical uh, discussion. This is about governance, about rules of engagement, and this is making uh, again, new challenges ahead of us. And there are, of course, the, the keywords like digital and health literacy. Those will become key components, but not only for us, also for the general public and citizens. So in summary, um, the data drivenness will bring new methodological know-how and clinical know-how that we need to evolve. 
um, into a need to discuss also as a scientific community. And when it comes to framing, there is of course health and digital literacy, first of all, but we also need more insights on how we interpret presented information, how we react on it, and how we can actually enhance that clinical reasoning on those parts. And of course, my end question is, these skills that we will acquire will become the data wrangler that can unlock the potential that's actually hidden into the data um, that you are now collecting. Thank you very much, Robin, for this great overview and also the idea of mixing art and research and uh, obviously radiology and AI. Um, I really like the phrase of visualization of data because that's actually what we do on the daily basis, right? And we try to improve mm -hmm. that. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, that. Um, I mean, you mentioned a few times about uh, enhancing it and getting it better than the human. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, ha we saw some concepts in which um, when using these kinds of methods, the images got smoother, but there was also some loss of information. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How can we, um, what's the way of going uh, further with this? topic in also preventing the loss of information because we want, we try to enhance the information in one hand but on the other hand we also have I mean, there's always a risk of doing new methods or uh, mm -hmm. having new software and we also lose uh, some information yeah. what are your thoughts on that um i do think it's important to uh, experiment and and try to see what are all the um the uh, possibilities that we can have to look at this information in another way and we to really explore. Um, I think it's also very important that we find a way to communicate these findings because you might do some research and I might do some research and what we still notice and that's more the publication bias than another bias is that mostly positive results are published. I think it's very important to be very open and honest what we tried, what's working, what is not working, what might be a part that we have to leave of a part that we need to go into depth to. So I think their openness within the research community is actually very important to uh, limit those elements and then really explore how we can look at it. Yeah, so really give the data limitations and also the, I guess the packages, uh, but yeah. And make them very transparent on, on how they deal. I sometimes hear that one data set has other results in different packages, but then when you look at how do the packages work, they use other calculations, they use other, yeah. they use other mathematical approaches. They are apparently also accepted in, in research, so it becomes a very complex uh, study. So I think transparency there and the fair use of data with the fair principles, I think those are really uh, key elements to, to be transparent about the work that we do. And involve clinicians, all type of clinicians, everyone is actually dealing with that AI and try to see um, how they react to it. I think they, there is more user involvement, the user testing needed, and also very transparent communication on that part. I totally agree with you with the data limitations to have that as a software package, but also be open with that in validating mm -hmm. your data in other yeah. uh, settings as well. Um, so you said that there were some few concepts really all already uh, in process. So can you tell us a bit more on what we can expect uh, in the near, like really near future on? Uh... Oh, um, what I see now in the really near future is, is the um, the idea of the of the health data space to actually allow us the secondary use. Uh, it's still under negotiation, it's not yet been developed, so there's a long way to go, mm -hmm. um, which I would find very interesting is that we can actually um, combine data that we know from, um, from radiology in our clinical experiments and in our, in our studies with more population-based data. I think that mm -hmm. might be a very interesting element for us, how can we combine, combine these elements? Now at this moment, what I, for example, see is that when we look at research and imaging, we are mainly looking at the effect for one, for one patient or for one group. Uh, in larger studies, if we can run them, uh, we can see that there's a larger element. 
but when you should be able to unlock secondary data based on the entire European community, then we should have quite some insight on how radiology is flowing, supporting uh, certain decision making, where is the key element in the decision making process of a clinician. So I think you might have um, also insights at an other level than the imaging procedure itself, that how the imaging results are actually shaping and, and steering uh, clinical pathways. I think that might be a new area that you can discover in large data sets. Then. As like reference references as well, like reference yeah. lines for different, uh, and obviously also what you mentioned, the diagnosis, prognosis, and also treatment uh, options that can be uh, broadened, I think. I think, I think uh, last week there was an interesting seminar uh, here in Rotterdam, um, uh, on AI as well, and there another important fact uh, or that was mentioned was mm -hmm. um, that's the side that's where the focus of AI mainly is now, right? The diagnosis uh, and trying yeah. to go to the next step of prognosis as well. But what about the other clinical workflow of starting with the acquisition and also the imaging, what we discussed, what you said, with the visualization, optimizing that. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that with, from the Federation as well? I think that's a key thing with, especially yeah. the research within the Radiographer Society, right? Uh, and the knowledge there that could I, get us further. When, when it comes to really acquisition of systems, um, I think then in even in the very near future, for me, there is a shift where we now are still focusing on acquiring a high level quality image um, that we will be acquiring high level quality data. Mm -hmm. And that there also needs to be a shift on, on how we look at our imaging procedure um, to actually image a patient with in the right dose at that moment, of course, um, but with a high quality data that is being output. Um, and I see even see an evolution where we are not only looking at more the quality of an image, but that we are looking at the quality of the raw data and optimizing at the level of the raw data. I think that might I think that's an evolution that is very, um, very new to us. Certainly, when there is also standardization going on for, for example, radionomics, we are very um, sensible to, to very variations between patients to do their calculations. I think there we need also very strict imaging for high quality data output. But I think there will be a new area also for radiographers to actually look at the, the imaging part in a new way and not the image as an output. I think there will be uh, the first part. And we also see a lot of tools in development, like for example, auto positioning on CT and, and, and corrections yes. of height and so on. Yeah. Um, there also, those are very interesting tools and they they work quite good, but it's still the 80-20 rule. There are still yeah. patients who are not applying correctly. And what I think is very important when it comes to radiographers is actually not only train them in the framing, that they are actually also knowing how to do interpretation of the results you see on the screen, but also to be uh, aware of compliance to that kind of automation and not just follow um, the computer as he says, but stay critical. Otherwise, we will have um, discussion service to and as the one who uh, drove his car into the lake because the GPS had to turn left. Um, that kind of situation, we do not want to have those in, in radiology. So I think human error studies also at that level and compliance automation will be key points in education and training um, and later on, of course, when they are practicing, because it's something that needs to be trained, uh, as we see in pilot, in pilot. These are some very important uh, points that you know, uh, notified, because we there were some examples uh, exactly on the optimization of um, doing the exams with um, Ha having an AI tool like position the table, etc. Mm -hmm. But then you have the exceptions, right? You have children who sometimes do not like it's difficult to have them positioned uh, in the right way. Yeah, uh, but also the intensive care patients with uh, questions and uh, etc. So, so you mm -hmm. still have that human part indeed to have um, to have high quality or get high quality data. And another point is the bias. That's the, that's something that intrigues me uh, very much in um, and, and I how think to deal the with bias, that. Uh, yeah. uh, the bias. Yeah, uh, the bias deserve uh, a, 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 a new world webinar. 
yeah. <laughs> but yeah. education indeed to uh, be aware of uh, yeah. of obviously uh, acquiring the images but also interpreting the images something within the educational part I think is a mm -hmm. big need maybe another webinar uh, session to discuss the bias part because we have it in all kinds of faces and yeah, uh, and then also need to be aware of the bias that you are bringing to the table as healthcare providers. I think that's only that part is already a huge reflection on how think how we might edit ourselves. Yeah. I'm actually out of my questions, Gennaro. Do you have anything to uh, add? Oh, I think I think that uh, now the the time is uh, over. Over. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we uh, we can uh, go to conclude our uh, session for today. I am uh, so happy that it was uh, so really productive. And uh, also the, um, the it's uh, that way that we like uh, to do a joint meeting, uh, joint uh, webinar with the European Federation of uh, Radiographers Societies. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have to just talk uh, one minute uh, about our annual meeting. And I think uh, it will be in uh, an interesting country, <laughs> I suppose. I can uh, add uh, a few sentences to that. Thank you again, Robin. It was a great overview and a great discussion. Uh, looking forward to future joint webinars, uh, as Gennaro mentioned. And obviously, the, our annual meeting, as I mentioned before, during the webinars will be in Pisa this year uh, on October 13th and 14th. And the call for abstracts is still open until the 3rd of July. So please submit your abstracts and we hope to see you over there. Uh, on the 6th of July, there is another joint webinar with the European Society of Breast Imaging, and we hope to see you then. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, hope to see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.